I always say start by thinking about why you went into business, okay? So who is that one customer that actually, if you just had two or three of them, your life would be perfect, okay? And we're going to start with that one customer, okay? If you're B2B, that customer will be a company, and obviously if you're B2C, that customer will be um, an individual. But either way, we're thinking about one customer. And the reason we're going to start with this process is I always say a good way to test um, the playbook is with a single use case. So we're not going to try out a hundred things at once, one thing at a time so that we know what it is we're tweaking. So the first test that we're going to do to see how well this works is we're going to use the process to understand our ideal customer, okay? But in reality, that's not where this process ends. You know, it can be used to confirm anything from your roadmap down to your differentiation, to inform anything from your pricing down to your messaging, and to understand anything from new markets to new gaps or the competition. Okay. So I'm going to quickly just jump to the outcomes of all of this. So why are we doing this? Okay, I've mentioned that at the end of the day, making marketing research a way of life will improve or optimize absolutely everything your business does. But what are the steps? You know, that, that that's quite a grand statement to make, right? So, so what are the steps that this process feeds into in order to get to that stage where I've got a fully optimized business. And these are just a few of them. So for our clients, we have used this process um, that I'm about to go through to, um, amongst other things, define their messaging. Okay, inform SEO pay-per-click for them to understand their personas better. The words they use for those personas to do a gap analysis, so to understand what gaps they are in the market that they can fill, to improve the user journey, any decks they have, any presentations they've done, always need a rework after they've gone through this process. Their channels to market, understanding their processes internally, um, and then informing mm -hmm. what tools they use, okay? So eventually you're going to have to get some tools um, to, uh, deliver on this, some of those tools will be free. Some of those tools you might already use, um, but don't, just don't use as part of this process because you haven't yet invested in this mindset of making marketing research a way of life. So, oh, I thought we're not gonna run through that slide again. Mm. Okay, I have a problem there. I do apologize about that. Um, okay, so really quickly, before we get started, um, whatever we do, we can't afford to confuse your ideal customer with your ideal persona. So these, so persona being an individual, ideal customer profile being what the customer or avatar looks like that we're dealing with. And people go, well, surely if I'm dealing with a one man band, then my ideal customer avatar and my persona are one person. Mm, sometimes, not always. And the example that again, those who are here on Thursday have already heard, but I think it makes the point really well, is um, a big sporty looking guy goes into a bike shop to buy a bike, you'll be very wrong in assuming and going ahead with the sales pitch that sells him the most expensive um, sports bike in the shop. If he happens to be a father who's looking for a bike for his eight-year-old daughter. And it actually turns out that what the daughter wants in a bike is a pink bike that looks like Phoebe's from Friends and it's got um, butterflies on it okay so just because you're dealing with a one-man band doesn't mean there's only one persona and so and so again this process helps us to understand the personas 
that we need to address. Okay. Um, so this is just really quickly going through what an ideal company profile looks like, okay? It might have something to do with specific industries. It may or may not be to do with specific geographies. So in my case, where in the world the client is doesn't really matter, but the geographies they want to launch in are the UK and the US because that's where I have experience. Um, sometimes there's a revenue associated with it. You know, how much does this company make so that they, I know they can afford um, my product. Uh, if it's a product, for instance, um, something around employee rewards, you might want to be dealing with companies above a certain employee count so that you know that it's worth it for both you and them. So these are just examples. But if I go back to what I said right at the beginning, when you're working out, and we always just try to start with three, the three main things that contribute your ideal customer, do try to think about some of the reasons why you are in business. The second thing that has to be in there are their key challenges, especially their challenges around whatever it is you do. Okay, so what you see in front of you is the process from beginning to end, okay? At the top here, we're going to start by understanding the draft of the ideal customer profile that we want to we want to get more of. Okay, so you come up with your three points of who you believe to be your ideal customer profile, and then the first part of this is really to test. And you'll see if you as we go down the list that for everything, we jot down three points, and then we confirm it. Okay before moving on to the next. So the reason we're using one customer initially is because we want to get more of that one customer. So we then say, I really like customer X. And I think the reason customer X and I get along is because they're in a particular geography. They have a particular problem that I know I can solve and their revenue is above a certain amount so I know they can afford my product. Okay, so I'm just using my own business as an example there. Your top three may be different, okay? Stage one is to now confirm that this is the real reason that me and this client get along really well. And it's not actually something softer and underlying that I haven't yet put my finger on yet. And I'm not being misled by these three criteria. And so therefore, we then want to look for more what we call look-alike prospects to test this with, okay? So if I get a customer who meets A, B, C, actually, does it turn out that there's at least the opportunity to discuss my product, okay? And that's all we're doing here. So everything in blue are the steps that we're going to go through. Everything in brown on the side are the outcomes of that particular stage of the process. And then what we just can't cover today, because normally this is um, a half a day course, um, is the benefits of each stage of the process. I will go through some of them. The methods and tools to use for each stage of the process, because again, the methods that I'd recommend and the tools that I'd recommend will differ depending on your business type, your business size, your ideal customer, the personas you're talking to, the regions in which you operate, and your intended outcomes. There are, however, a couple of core tools that everyone should be using, and those I will go through. Okay, so we have our first three. And so the first thing that I'm going to talk about today is LinkedIn. How do I go about getting a lot of lookalike customers, prospects to put into my funnel and start speaking to, even though I haven't gone through the whole process, just stage one to start understanding um, my ICP a bit more, okay. Before I go into LinkedIn and how we use it, a lot of people go, well, why are you teaching me to do this process? Isn't that what you do? Isn't that something you can just do for me, okay? There's value in you understanding the process, firstly. Secondly, we've already said this process should be a way of life. 
why should it be a way of life? No one actually understands the nuances of your business as much as someone who is in that business. And therefore, some conversations that I might have on your behalf, I may just miss some of those nuances, some of the opportunities, you know, something that you hear, you think actually that's a real easy fix for me. I can just add that to my roadmap, you know, and work over the weekend on a couple of lines of code to incorporate it or whatever. So at some point you have to be involved in this process where someone like me or my organization will come in handy is for this data I'm talking about now. So how do we now go about, I think I understand my ideal customer. How do I now, now go about getting lots more of those? Okay. And the tool that I use is LinkedIn mainly. Um, why LinkedIn? So LinkedIn is really good at finding you what we call lookalike audiences, especially if you're dealing B2B. But even with B2C, um, it's still a lot better converter. So in terms of conversions, um, it still does a lot better than a lot of the other social media platforms, if you know what you're doing. And so how does this work? So the ideal part of LinkedIn to use is actually an add-on, which is called Sales Navigator. And yes, Sales Navigator comes as a price, at a price. Anyone who's actually doing this workshop with me, um, we do ask them to sign up for, uh, everyone's entitled to a month free trial. And we ask them to sign up for the month before they come onto the workshop so that we can show them how well it works. And basically in short, without having to do a demo of the product, what Sales Navigator allows you to do is look at some of those, if we talk about those top three um, traits that you're looking for, plug them into Sales Navigator and Sales Navigator will just give you the list of companies or individuals within companies that meet the criteria. So for example, I could ask Sales Navigator to show me all the companies in the UK who have a revenue over 2 million for argument's sake, who have um, a, a particular role. So I might be looking to talk to the HR person within the organization um, or the people person within the organization or people who deal with uh, companies that deal with specific keywords. If you are looking for um, more information on the industry. You can also choose by industry. You can choose by sector. And you just type in, or actually choose from drop down lists, what it is you're looking for to match who you believe to be your ICP. Okay. And Sales Navigator will just tell you who those people are on LinkedIn. Okay. So then the hard work, yes, becomes now reaching out to them and getting into a conversation, but that's not part of the process that we're talking about today. So today we're just talking about the actual market research bit. So assuming you've got a way of doing that, that bit of bringing all these people in for conversations, what are you going to talk to them about? Okay, so you're going to ask them a lot about two things. So we've got two questions. By the time you finish with this, the idea is you've got a list of 10 questions. And every time you talk to someone, you at least ask the first two questions to determine whether or not they are your um, ICP. And any of the other questions so that you can frame the rest of the conversation to make it efficient. Okay, everything is about making this process efficient. How do you know that you need this process, right? If you find yourself spending a lot of time trying to convince people and that your product is right for them, then one of two things is either wrong. Either you have a product with no market, <laughs> or you simply haven't yet determined who your ICP is, okay? So um, within our courses, a phrase that we use a lot is that amateurs convince. If you find yourself pleading with people to get your, then already there's something amiss, something's not aligned, and that's what we're trying to fix. Um, especially in this first bit of the process, okay? So all of a sudden, 
Prue and her company or whoever you choose to use are sending lots of lookalike people your way. And you will have some lookalike people already in your um, sales pipeline, etc. What is it we're asking them about? The next two questions will determine the personas you need to be talking to. So the next two questions are, what is your challenge, particularly around your product? Okay, so um, if you're a travel management company, you know, what are your main pro challenges around travel at the moment? Okay, that's the first question. And then the second question, which most people forget to ask is, why haven't you fixed that already? Okay. Or variants of those two questions, but th those are basically the two bits of information you want to get. Okay. And what should pop out from there is definitely the personas involved. Okay. So how do personas pop out of these questions? So someone will say something like, well, my challenge around travel is X, but I don't get much voice share because the IT person or the ops person or whatever has been stung by A, B, C, D, and therefore they have the biggest voice in terms of which solution we go for, okay? So then you get an idea of who the user personas are, okay? The little girl who wants a bike like Phoebe's and who the buyer personas are, the sporty dad who comes in to buy the bike for the little girl, okay? Naturally, from those two questions, that will pop out. If you're lucky, another thing that will pop out from those two questions are some of the competitors you should be looking at, okay? Again, you can just Google what it is you do and a whole lot of competitors will come up. And depending on what you do, that list of competitors could be phenomenal. Why boil the ocean trying to match every single competitor out there when really the only competitors you need to worry about are those who your ICP are also talking to, okay? There'll be people who look like they're like for like, but when you get further down in this process and you start looking at the differentiation, you'll see that actually they're things that they do differently and therefore their ICP will be different. And therefore just trying um, to match them, compete with them, undercut them because they're a competitor on paper is a waste of time, okay? So by looking at who your ICP and therefore extensions of that ICP when we get to audience extension are talking to, are already looking at, are considering or have used in the past and stopped using, that's all you need to inform your research in order to be agile and make differences immediately. That's not to say there's never a need for a bigger market research to understand who else is out there, but you don't have to wait three months for those results. You have already at your disposal the biggest and greatest resource for this exercise, and that's your ideal customer. So just to reiterate, however you decide to frame your questions, the first questions that we're asking in order to confirm that who we're speaking to is an ICP whose problems you can address are, what are their challenges and what gaps do they have in terms of meeting those challenges? But more importantly, why haven't they addressed that problem so far? So in other words, why did you end up coming to me okay, or to my business? What did you try that didn't work? Okay. And just a reminder, we're using all of this to inform everything that we do, okay? And that inf includes the tools and resources and the methods that we're going to use, okay? Why have I put this up here? Because some of the responses that come out, sometimes people go, oh, I've gone through that and I've got a whole lot of information and it's either too much for me to do anything with or quite a lot of information, but there's not actually anything actionable there. 
Um, each time I talk to someone, it's a completely different list of things and, and, and. And so ways that you start to refine your questions as you speak to more and more people um, is to find out what it is they currently employ. So what do they use in terms of finding out information? Okay, because that's what's going to inform your channels. Okay, what things would they consider trying maybe instead of what they currently use, what they've used in the past, um, et cetera, because that's going to inform both your roadmap and where it's worth spending energy making changes, okay? Um, and what things do they avoid? What things do they just not go near that they have never seen any value in A, B, C? Because um, all this will help you to confirm, to inform, everything else that you do okay um within a one hour session or 45 minute session i can't go through an exhaustive list of um all the questions or variants of the questions um but you know for those who request the slide deck afterwards there are lists and lists of these of um different types of questions which will give you the same sort of answers um but are different for different use cases and scenarios and you might want to play around with them and swap them out but the really good thing about these questions is we've tried to frame them in the way that they can just fit into any conversation so you're not always looking for half an hour or an hour with a prospect in order to do a bit of marketing research okay at any one time you've just got a couple of questions that you know that whoever i get on the phone i'm going to ask them these two questions in line with where we are at the moment in terms of those blue boxes down here um, in the process. Okay, so we've asked the first two questions. We find out what our personas are. We find out who the competitors are. Again, we're going to confirm this. How do we confirm this? So we've now gone from two questions to four questions and everyone we get the opportunity to speak to, we try to ask as many of these four questions as possible. Everyone who we think is our ICP. And the reason we're asking them all these questions is to confirm that they are our ICP before we go in for the close, okay? And just talking really quickly about the close, I'm not a salesperson, okay? So sales is the one thing that like a lot of people, you know, I sweat, I, you know, panic um, once I get onto a sales call or get called into a sales meeting because sales isn't what I do. And as I've said before, you know, I believe that it's amateurs that struggle to convince and spend lots of time convincing. Instead, I like to go through this process of conversation so that I know already that I'm talking to the right person and this person is open because you can't close someone unless they're open, okay? So that's what we're doing here. Okay, so in terms of what happens once we've got our personas and our um, competitors or our list of competitors, the next question is really emphasizing on the competitor bit. When you, when you hear someone who's, who's telling you about what they've tried, before what or who they've tried before and why didn't that work okay so again you're going back to so why are you talking to me now and the reason we do this sorry is because we're trying to establish some gaps so whatever gaps they are in the market okay now this is the bit that clients who i work with on this process especially when we're doing it as a coaching um exercise um, and not us doing it for them. They get really excited once they start talking to more people and they're getting all these insights on personas and competitors and they're beginning to see trends um, that they can action. And then we start looking at the gaps. And at that point, people sometimes get overwhelmed. Oops, let me just go back a slide. People sometimes get a bit overwhelmed and they're like, hmm, there's so many gaps. <laughs> I don't exactly know which of the gaps to fill, okay? which is fine because you don't have to fill every gap. In fact, 
one of the things that I truly believe is just because there's a gap in the market doesn't mean there's a market in the gap, okay? Sometimes that gap exists for a really good reason, okay? Um, clients think they need it. It's kind of a nice to have, but the cost of doing it is quite prohibitive and not a cost that they're necessarily willing to pay. Okay, so think about um, buying a house. Okay, lots of people um, like the idea of buying houses, doing them up and selling them. Okay, so you buy a house, it needs a bit of TLC. You then spend a hundred thousand pounds doing the house up to the spec that you want. Okay, or more importantly, doing the house up to the spec that your customer wants. Or if you haven't gone through this process, doing the house up to the spec of what you believe everyone wants, which either ends up not pleasing anyone or costing an absolute fortune. Either way, for argument's sake, we say we spend £100,000 doing up the house. Everyone knows that you can't now take that £100,000 price tag and just add it to the price of the house and all of a sudden sell a house which previously sold at £250,000 for £350,000 because of the amount of work you've done on it. And why not? Well, there are lots of things that go into the price of a house, you know, including where it is, for example, the age of the house, for example, sometimes whether there's a school nearby, um, or it might be that you're back onto a really noisy, loud industrial estate. All of these things have an effect on house prices, okay? And we all understand that, okay? So therefore, just because there's a gap in the market, you see a trend where quite a few people are mentioning this gap. Don't get too excited and start rubbing your hands and, and just go off to address that gap. If that gap is going to cost so much that you're not going to realize that price, okay? The pricing of that product or service um, within that market or region just won't allow for the work that it requires, okay? So just because there's a gap in the market doesn't mean there's a market in the gap, okay? So why are we doing this then? So we're doing this to find actionable insights, okay? What are those gaps that actually we can fulfill? And that could be that we can fulfill them ourselves, which basically means in terms of our roadmap of features or whatever, we're just gonna swap things around a bit because we already know that if we can get that feature done in the next release, we've got a new customer out there, okay? So, Basically, what I'm saying is naturally at this point, you're now getting to a stage where you're inv investigating the opportunities. Which of these gaps are a quick fix? Which of these competitors need looking at in more detail? Um, which of these personas have a greater influence in buying my product and therefore in terms of my messaging, my position? and the channels that I use to market, I need to spend more effort there and less effort elsewhere. And hopefully you're beginning to see by now that all this is helping us to do is hone in on where we spend our efforts so that not only is the marketing research done on a budget, on a shoestring budget, but everything else that we do thereafter costs us more in terms of both pounds and resources, people, time, because we've invested this little bit of work up front. Okay. Once we start investigating these opportunities, one thing that will come out is where we shine. Okay. And so again, we're putting these, everything we learn, we're putting it back into the into the list of questions. Okay. So we establish a couple of gaps, okay? So the people you speak to say, actually, what's really needed, so just to simplify it completely, okay? You, you're selling hats, right? And a couple of people you talk to go, actually, what's really needed is 
hats with a feather in them. That's the in thing and that's what's really needed, okay? So that's your gap. No one else is doing hats with a feather in and apparently that's what everyone wants. That then becomes question number five. So the next time you talk to that next person in the funnel or who we've brought in from the audience extension project, you're gonna go through the first two questions to ensure that they are your ICP. You're going to confirm the personas and then question number five goes, um, and do you happen to be one of these people who at the moment is looking into hats with a feather or something to that effect? Sometimes you don't even have to ask the question because it will come out as part of the questions before. And the, the more you do this process, the more you refine your questions, okay? So with most of our clients, by the time we go through the half day exercise, we've got a list of 10 questions. And then when we catch up with them, um, two to four weeks later, they've managed to narrow that list of questions down to five and still get all the same information that they need. So are you my ICP? Who are the personas? Who are the competitors I should be looking at? What are the gaps that haven't been fulfilled for you? And how do I meet that in a unique way? Okay. And that, how do I meet that in a unique way becomes the basis of our marketing, frame, our messaging framework. Again, which is where we come in to help now take everything that we've learned into messaging, into actions, into strategy, that resonates. How much of that strategy you do yourself or we do for you, it's completely up for discussion depending on what resources you have available, what tools you have available, what you currently use and what you currently do well, okay? We'll take over the bits that you don't do so well. Most organizations already have tools, channels that they use or employ or they license and don't use at all that can be really handy in this process. And so rather than just dish out um, a list of providers, tools and services, it's really important to do a bit of a, an audit of what you have and start there, you know, start with how do I use what I have for this process? Okay, I already spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. How do I use LinkedIn in this process, okay? Really simple. So just think of LinkedIn as a search engine, okay? And all these words or the answers that you're getting as you ask the questions, this growing list of questions, type them back into Google, type them back into LinkedIn, find out who is doing those things and you know how they seem to be getting on, what words are working for them, okay? doing all of this manually, of course, especially if it's a long list of competitors, ends up taking a lot of time. And so um, they are tools that you can use to reverse find out, you know, what keywords people are using and how they're working for them. Or again, you just get experts in those fields um, to do that for you, whilst you focus on getting this process absolutely spot on and then you don't stop doing it, okay? We keep going through and refining. And people say, well, why refine it? Once I know who my ICP is, why do I keep going through this process? Well, it's really simple. We already used the example of how the world has changed in the past 18 months. One of the reasons we've seen so many companies pivot is because all of a sudden, what they were doing for one reason or another isn't a good fit for their ICP. It's no longer addressing the gaps. Okay, the way we keep on top of that and keep a finger on the pulse of that in real times is by making this process a way of life. When we do this and we do this well, as I said, it then feeds into everything else we do. Okay, so using this very process, starting with one customer, your ICP, who you is helping you, whether they know it or not, to inform and refine this list of questions that ends up being maybe just five questions in order to establish whether or not someone is open so that we can close them. Or if we're not talking to them in person, how to reach that person through the channels um, that both 
guest work. And I think we try to um, illustrate this all here. So this is how many outcomes can come from this. So starting by just looking at the customer challenges, okay, so that we can address the customer's needs, taking those words that we hear over and over again. Trust me, once you start doing this process, your value proposition will reveal itself to you. You know, people spend two days on courses and exercises, getting to the bottom of their value proposition. What are you using that to inform? Okay, what are you using to inform that? Isn't it better to use your ICP to inform that? Okay. And from that, the messaging, okay? The messaging comes out of this process, okay? Um, which bits of expertise are missing from your organization to meet what these customers need will come out of that process. The tools to use will come out of the process. Some of these tools, like I said, you'll already have them in house, but you're just not using them properly yet because you haven't established how they fit in to addressing not the problems of many, just the problems of your ICP. Some people say, well, I have got lots of ICPs. Okay. Well, generally that's not true. And the reason that's not true is by delving into what ICP or ICA stands for, ideal. You may have lots of different customers who are the ideal. And actually, contrary to popular belief, focusing on the ideal customer doesn't stop you from dealing with other companies, okay? Um, if anything, it makes your message so clear, so refined, it highlights out your differentiators so well that even people who don't meet all the criteria of your ICP but need some of those aspects that are now just really clear wherever you talk about yourselves or other people talk about you, um, they come on board as well. Okay. If you go back to the list that I showed at the beginning of the clients I've worked with, okay. So this process that I've used for LinkedIn marketing services, okay. Someone sees the outcomes and think, oh, I could do with those sorts of outcomes in my business because I have problem A and I want to get to position Z and Cambridge go to market say that if this is my problem launching in the UK or the US and I want these outcomes, okay, so an influx of customers meeting your ICP within that region, then they're the people to go to. All the bits in the middle of that box don't really matter. Okay, we spend too much time talking about the bits in the middle, what I do to meet the problem, when actually what we need to be doing is articulating the problem in a way that resonates with the prospect, articulating their intended outcomes in places that they would naturally be searching for information and that's three quarters of the problem sorted out. So hopefully market research, the bigger pick, the bigger one, that big expensive thing still has its place. What we're talking about today, marketing research, I actually believe is the precursor to market research and not the other way around. You make marketing research a way of life Okay, regardless of what your organization is and what your needs are, even that market research bit then becomes more refined. You're no longer asking anyone who's doing market research for you to boil the ocean because you're giving them a very confined um, area or list that we know works because of all the work that we're putting going through those five steps in the playbook again and again and again as part of all of the conversations we have, okay? And that could be you as a business owner. That can be whoever deals with your customer services. If you've got a reception, make this familiar to your receptionist and just make sure that we're all inputting our responses into the right framework, into, in the, into the same um, 
system, okay, which for most people will be their CRM. So that's really the premise of what we do, how we help clients. But more importantly, this is a process that you should be doing yourself to a great extent, okay? And if you still need further information on how to do that, do reach out, do come to the stand. Um, and there are many ways that we can help um, from, like I say, these half day courses that we've been talking about down to just some courses around the tool. So um, in two weeks time, we have um, a workshop on uh, using LinkedIn from a customer, from a company perspective. So lots of the stuff that's out there about LinkedIn at the moment is all around your personal profile. Actually, company pages, what could you be doing on LinkedIn to feed into this very same process? Lots without spending an extra penny. So, you know, again, we've got a lot of tools at our disposal that are free that we just don't use because we're not thinking of them in line with marketing research as a way of life. And that's the end of my presentation. Great. Yes. Ah, right. I, I disappeared somewhere for some reason. That was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm terribly sorry. I've got a horrible feeling. I missed the beginning of the recording. Yes, because I heard it go. Um, yes. Recording is in process at some point. There was this annoying thing on my screen, and it was like, "What the hell's that? Go away! I'm listening." <laughs> I was like, "Oh no." <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely fine. I'm sure we can redo it or anything if anyone wants the full thing. But yeah. But uh, no, that that was that was brilliant. That was that absolutely brilliant. Are you from Finder Somewhere? Are you are you a part of Finder Somewhere? Am I what? Sorry. A part of Finder Somewhere. Am I a person Finder Somewhere? Part of. Oh no, no. All oh, right. Okay. Well, we must try and join up on LinkedIn. I think because um, it sounded really interesting what you were talking about. I'll send you my um, LinkedIn link now and you can just do what you need to do. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> All right, well, that was fantastic. Um, I was talking to yourself, do you know that? Sorry? I said, you know when you're doing the, the whatever and you can't see any, so one person came on and hopped off and one person, so you can't see anyone because they're viewing it everywhere else. So yeah. it's like you're just talking to yourself. Yes. And it's really disconcerting. Yeah, well, I, it's, it's a real shame, actually. Um, I think we were hoping that um, the speakers were going to invite um, their audience to uh, join the Zoom. But because it's all live streaming, it's happened all the way through the show, that no one's actually bothered jumping on the Zoom. They're all watching it. Yeah, so I, when I did mine, I thought, oh, okay, so the people I invited haven't come along. And then I got off, and then all of a sudden there was this influx of, good job, good job. And I was like, where were you? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, um, yes, I, mean, I had a lady on earlier this, earlier today and she had a two-hour slot and it was just, it was just this lady and myself and she managed to talk to herself for two hours. It's so difficult. <laughs> so, so difficult. Oh, well, you absolutely nailed it. I thought it was brilliant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> Right. Have you uh, have you enjoyed the show? Have I done what, sorry? Have you enjoyed the show? I have. So I actually put a post on my LinkedIn yesterday about how brilliant it was. And to be honest, I think for the whole of day one, I was just mesmerised by the platform. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very cool. <laughs> oh my goodness it's like shall we try and break it shall we see everything we can do with it shall we, uh, no, we spent to... months trying to do that <laughs> <laughs> we were like kids in a sweet shop <laughs> only to then go back onto my stand and be like oh we've had all these people 
come to the stand whilst we've been away <laughs> <laughs> playing with the system. <laughs> Where's the chat box? Okay, so there you go. That's my my LinkedIn. You'll see I've put you guys up as my banner and everything. I'm going to change that tonight to put in my next um, speaking engagement, but yes. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Well, I'll, I'll copy and paste that and um, I will join you on LinkedIn. Thank you. Excellent. All right, Prue, you take care. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.